You ready? You're listening to The Real Pineapple Podcast Network. <clears throat> Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, days, and gays. This is Real Pineapple. This is your humble host, Hunter, here. So, uh, I'm really excited to bring this interview uh, to y'all. So, I watched this documentary called uh, American Mileage uh, about uh, Cam Cole and his journey through uh, the Deep South, uh, playing music, um, visiting America, learning more about himself. It's an incredibly well done documentary by uh, uh, Tim Hardiman. And luckily, they had a little bit of time to go ahead and stop by the show and talk to me about American Mileage, talk about uh, Cam's career, talk about uh, the music industry as a whole, where they think it's heading, talking about the origins of blues. Uh, we talk about drugs. Uh, we, get, we get into a ton of topics in this interview. And I, I have to, again, uh, thank uh, Cam Cole and uh, Tim uh, Hardiman for stopping by and making the time to stop by the show. So uh, it's a long interview, as uh, as a lot of interviews on The Real Pineapple are. It's uh, about 40 minutes. So uh, kick your feet up, relax, have a drink, and enjoy my conversation with Tim Hardiman and Cam Cole. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. This is the real pineapple. This is your humble host, Hunter. Here, happy uh, Tuesday. Probably by the time y'all hear this, that the documentary should be uh, live for American Mileage, and I am very honored and privileged to have uh, the stars of it, uh, the director. Um, as I lose my voice, I've got uh, uh, Tim Hardiman here, and I've got um, I've got Cam Cole. Holy crap! Um, that's this is amazing. Uh gentlemen, good morning. How are you guys doing? Very good, thanks, Hunter. Very good, yeah, thanks. Thanks for, thanks for having us. Oh, thank you yeah. so much. Thanks so much for making the time. So I actually watched a documentary uh this past weekend, and then I watched it again this morning for my coffee. Um, I actually liked it even more the second time, and I real and I adored it the first time. So um uh top marks to both of you, just straight out the gate. Um Tim, I'm going to start with you. Um, sure. So coming from your uh, CMTV uh, as a CMT background, why was this documentary um, like such an easy pivot for you as far as taking on this project? Well, when I was approached to do it, um, the idea was basically to have Cam go to all of these historic, musically significant places in the U.S., and um, I had done a travel show, so I was kind of familiar with that whole format, but I wanted to make it a little bit different. And then when I got to know Cam a little bit um, over Zoom and kind of vibe with his personality, I, I kind of realized, oh, this is going to be fun. You know, I mean, this guy is, is pretty much up for anything. What I didn't expect um, and kind of what turned the film into what it is is when we got to these places, the guy who was showing us around them, Cam, turned out to be a little more interesting than the stories behind those places themselves. And that's not <laughs> to take anything away from those locations. They're 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 wonderful locations, but um, you know they they were just a uh, uh, backdrops to to uh, events that that happened. Cam, on the other hand, living breathing musical legend um who has an incredible story of his own and uh one of the most unique people that i have ever met um you know just from the way he lives his life uh, um to the way he creates his art um so I, I decided to kind of shift a little bit and bring the uh the focus more onto cam as the film progresses you kind of see that yeah i think you did a great job of kind of balancing the two because because there is definitely a history lesson of sorts as far as blues and in the deep south but to your point i think it does go ahead and kind of make a switch um especially when you guys get into mississippi um as far as uh as far as kind of switching to cam uh cam kind of switching it to you sir um what attracted you to doing a documentary and kind of giving people more of this uh access into your life and getting uh, letting people get to know you a little bit 
what what was the question sorry i didn't quite hear that oh yeah uh sorry um what was what was the attraction as far as doing a project like something like this and kind of uh, you know bearing your bearing your soul a little bit for people to get to know you a little better interesting question um yeah uh it's it's a it's, it's a bizarre thing to be observed and uh asked about with your life and and what you're about and who you are and stuff, I suppose. Uh, and especially go around with a film crew uh, while you're touring and have all that at the same time. I mean, uh, are you asking me what it's like or what was, is that, is that, what you, is that what you were asking? So I would say um, what it's like, but also what, what was the process as far as going? Like, was there any hesitation of saying yes to it or? Oh, right. I mean, I mean, as far as like, my career and things like that as a musician it's to yes uh as an individual for, from as a person yeah there's a lot of reservations of course there naturally is you know um but uh being in america and meeting the guys and and um getting to know them the the, the film crew and tim as well the director um we, we all really bonded it was it was great they're a really great bunch of guys and everyone involved was so sound that the experience was very, very pleasurable, actually. And um, it was, yeah, it was really cool. It was really, really cool uh, to share the road with those guys and to have, you know, a lot of jokes, a lot of fun along the way. Um, wow. All the things we did was 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 really, really cool. Um, and yeah, I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. All right. You know, uh, follow up question to that. Um, there's one point in the documentary that, actually had to pause because I was laughing so hard because I felt your vitriol in this moment. You, you, you're you talking about how you're a writer and you're not a fucking singer on the X Factor or or America's Got Talent. And I actually had to pause the documentary because that felt like such such a, a raw emotional uh, uh, reaction in real time. Is there... <sighs> How do I put this? Do you feel like do you feel like shows like that are kind of devoid of the artistic merit that you actually need to have to be a true artist, or do you think it's just too commercial? Like, why the vitriol in particular on, on that front? Because I feel like that's one of the few moments where you kind of are like pissed off, and I found that really interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I I think yes to all of that. To be honest with you, I mean, although you can get some talented artists that come out of these shows, I feel that there's a lot more talent from artists who have had to grind and and discover who they are and write music by themselves like a lot of these shows have songwriter teams and and a lot of the people who win these competitions they might be great singers but there's a lot of great singers in karaoke nights i don't think it really means a lot to be honest and fair it takes away from uh people such as myself who we live and we breathe this, you know, like I spent nearly a decade performing on the streets and I've written many, many songs and I spend a lot of time crafting my art. And I, I don't feel that I'm the same as a karaoke singer or someone who wins one of these competitions because I feel that my life is completely different. Um, and the sacrifices I've made are much greater. Um, but that doesn't, I don't want to take away from those people. They're also very yeah, talented, sure. but just in a different way, you know? Um, yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I just feel that the, the music that comes out of those things, just, it, I, I, I don't really feel it. I don't rate it in the same way as I would the works of like, you know, the Beatles or, you know, Oasis or any of these great bands and artists that we've, we've had. Uh, that come from just like the, the grassroots way of, of doing it, you know? Do you think, um, and, and, and I, I, I want to ask you this because obviously you do have a social media presence and being on Ted Lasso, you know, that's how I discovered you. And I was like, oh my God, this guy's fucking mm. talented as hell. And so I started listening to your stuff. Um, social media is, I think, one of the best and one of the worst things in the world. It's this like horrendous, echo chamber that can just screw up screw up so much shit and can cause so much pain and anguish and the list goes on and on what is your what is your love-hate relationship 
like with something like social media because obviously it helps promote you it helps you know help your brand but at the same time all the negative stuff um you mentioned at a point how you even said that you thought that you would be experiencing more division when you came to the U.S. Uh, than you actually did and how you found that people were just really kind and really helpful and really nice. But mm -hmm. if you were on social media, you wouldn't get that feeling. So, yeah, can you kind of talk to me a little bit as far as your kind of love-hate relationship with it? I mean, social media is is full of just clickbait stuff and it's, it's very politically driven. So it really paints the very nasty and ugly picture of the world. And, um, you know, America is a huge topic in the world. It's a, it's a <laughs> yeah. big, powerful country with a lot of divisive politics going on. And it, so from an outside perspective, it, it looks like you guys have a civil war on your hands 24-7. You know, if you, especially if you look on social media and then when you, you visit the place, it's not like that at all. So it was very interesting for me, especially like, put it this way, you know, just a few years before with like Donald Trump getting into power and all the things that was going on just before the lead up. From my perspective, like America was like crazy, you know, and then I go <laughs> there and everyone's really nice and everyone's really calm. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not the, the world that is portrayed by social media. Uh, and I kind of thought that was the case. Yeah. Before going, there. I thought surely it can't be like how it, how it's, how it's seen to be. Um, and it was it was it was really nice to to have that experience to go yeah, yeah social media is a load of shit <laughs> you know thank yeah. fucking god for that mate you know what i mean like, yeah <laughs> if, if it was actually like that fuck we're in trouble you know so yeah, yeah. Uh, you're not lying. uh tim we throw it to you sir um as far as doing the documentary what was the biggest um what was the biggest hurdle that you had as far as making this and then what was the biggest um what was the biggest surprise you had once you were able to kind of sit back and like look back on the experience um actually during the the production process there wasn't a lot of hurdles i mean there's stuff that would pop up unexpectedly that as they were happening i was so blind and had such a vision for it that um i couldn't see that it was actually providing me with conflict for the film for instance um like when when we got kicked off of beale street oh um, my god that pissed I, me off so <laughs> yeah it, it, we weren't happy about it either and then yeah. you know then, then we set up in, in um in new orleans and and we got rained out and at the time i was like i can't believe everybody's fucking up my film because <laughs> i just want to be good and then i realized like no dude this is this is what cam goes through it's 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 not and he even said it's like dude you know we did three of them one of those turned out great because that's about how it goes when you're out there on the streets. Um, uh, Jimmy Duck Holmes, who is uh, a, a blues legend, um, he, he kind of gave us a little bit of a hard time. God love him. But um, it provided some conflict in the film, you know, and yeah, I didn't uh, I didn't see it at the time. But when I look back at it, I'm like, man, th there's there's actually some some meat to this thing. It's not just like a little dog and pony show where cam cole goes and visits all the lovely states so that um that's kind of the hurdles during the uh during the the making of it but those weren't really big deals the bigger deal was like when we got distribution and had to get it across the finish line <laughs> that, <laughs> that stuff right there i i hate all that stuff and um hats off to our ep james uh for for taking the lion's share of those responsibilities but uh yeah that that's the stuff that i didn't like that i think sucks when it comes to making films fair so, um yeah. so, so i'm happy you brought up uh i'm happy you brought up jimmy uh, jimmy duck Holmes because um my parents uh my parents are both musicians and so like i went to my first open mic night like at three years old so i've been around i've seen god thousands of hours of live music probably hundreds of thousands at this point and I my heart broke for you, Cam, when you had to get moved because I know how much of a pain in the ass it is just to set up a mic stand and the stool, let alone like the one man band stuff that you have. And so my brain was just like, "Fuck these people, fuck these people." And then when you and then when you moved, and then you had the, the vocals coming from the I was just like, "Oh, this fucker can't catch a break." I was <laughs> like, I was I was feeling so so bad for y'all in that moment. Um, but with that said, um. 
being a one man band, doing all the stuff on your own, like what sort of like backups are there? Like, do you have like, uh, cause I know you have the, the two guitars that you Jerry rigged the fuck out of, which I thought was fascinating to see how you talked about that. I, I thought that was really cool, but at what point you kind of go like, well, I've had this guitar for, you know, 20 years, maybe it's time to get a new one. Like, where's that balance between staying authentic and maybe potentially upgrading your stuff? Um, no, I'm going to keep my guitars. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I, I like my guitars. No, I, the, the guitars have a sound. So I, I serve the sound at the end of the day. That's, that's how it is for me. Um, if it's hard to play, then I'll try and work around it. I mean, obviously, when it get when the, the neck breaks, then yeah, I'll try and repair the guitar. <laughs> but you know, if if the action's a little bit high or the intonation's a bit off, I'll I'll push harder on my strings or I'll 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 find a way of getting it in tune. You know, um, that that that's just that's that's just the the uh, the kind of school of musicianship that I kind of come from um and uh yeah yeah that's okay. what it is for me okay um i want to talk about your uh musical influences a little bit because uh you mentioned uh pantera which i was like hell yeah metallica hell yeah um i hadn't listened to soulfly so i actually listened to them a little bit over last week and i actually found uh, a couple songs there that i really dug so thanks for that um but you mentioning limp biscuit as an influence blew my mind i was like Really, Limp Bizkit, because I've listened to a, a ton of their stuff. So, kind of talk to me about musically, like what you grew up listening to, and like how you find these influences. Because I'm assuming you're listening to like you're in blues music, so I know you're listening to you know your Muddy Waters, your Ray Charles, like you're listening to all that stuff. But musically, mm. what do you kind of pull from to kind of get your sound? Well, I mean, I, I'm 31, so I grew up in the new metal era. So that was the music that I kind of rebelled against my parents to, you know. <laughs> uh, so <Fair. laughs> that's why Limp Bizkit is in the list, you know. Um, but my my dad was a big blues fan, and he got me into the blues from an early age, and the Beatles, of course. So I grew up listening to the Beatles and, and the Rolling Stones and then all those blues guys, and then the music that I kind of found myself that my parents were against was new metal. Um, and then that kind of got me into rap a little bit and like, uh, Cypress Hill and, and those kind of artists. Nice. Um, but you know, as, as time goes on, you, you, you grow up and then you find other music that's that, that you vibe with as well. So then I got into Oasis, I, I got into the white stripes, which heavily influenced what I do now. Um, and yeah, yeah, it, it kind of all stemmed from that, I suppose. Um, but the metal stuff, you can really hear that in especially in my my last album. Definitely. Um, and it's just that 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 real heavy, like driving, uh, solid kind of like Pantera sound that I, I really vibe with that. I really vibe with the tight, heavy noise, if you know what I mean. You know? It feels like you're playing angry a lot of the time, which I appreciate. Mm. Like 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 I, I still remember the first time I saw someone like slap their guitar. And I remember being like, wait, what? You can you can do that? And like, you know, that blew my like five-year-old mind. So seeing like how like when you're hitting the pedal, just how like there's there's a intensity to it that I actually was like, oh, that's really like that's really cool. And plus plus some of your stuff being banged up, it's actually like, okay, it actually kind of adds to your aura, <laughs> which I yeah. appreciate. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's banged up because I smacked the shit out of it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, there you go. <laughs> that, that's to me, that's a sound, you know, like it's, it's, you can, there's sometimes there's a vibe to play softly and other times you've got to smack the shit out of it when you're in the chorus or whatever. And yeah, I go for it every single time. Like music speaks so much to me and I feel so passionately about it that it makes me feel that way, you know? And I, I was always, when I'm watching bands, you know, I always go for it. If the crowd's not moving, I'll start the mosh bit. I don't give a fuck, you know? I, <laughs> it, it, I like, I like it when music goes, the, the idea that it kind of goes in your ear, into you and makes you feel differently, fucking accept i love to accept that and embrace it and when i'm playing then i completely surrender and embrace to it because it's my music is the stuff that i've put my heart and soul into it so that's why i smack the shit out of it because that's what it makes me fucking feel you know okay so yeah yeah it's almost a technique it's just another technique you know just just and i come from a, a the kind of musicianship that you just you feel it embrace it surrender to it and be it you know so that that's that's the vibe that I try and create. 
uh, follow up on that because this is a huge pet peeve of mine, just as someone who's been around musicians uh, their whole life. Uh, track listings for an album. I think it's incredibly important. I think that the artist puts the tracks in a specific order to take the listener on a journey. And it it <laughs> it really pisses me off when I go to a concert and there are people who just know the singles who clearly haven't digested the whole album and actually let the album make them feel the way that the artist wants them to feel. I think you're doing a disservice to yourself. I think you're doing a disservice to the to the artist. Um, it it really pisses me off. Talk to me about the importance of kind of laying your tracks out as far as when you're like, okay, this is what I want on the album. Now I got to figure out the order. Like, how, how do you kind of go about that? Well, you're not going to like this, mate, but my manager and producer, he actually does the track listing no! for me. I, I mean, I... I <laughs> I know. I'm sorry, dude. I'm so <laughs> sorry. But <laughs> thing is, he's a huge fan of, of my music. And when I come up with a, a, a fresh batch of songs that we're going to record, I go, here it is. I don't really think about the track listing too much. Okay. Uh, I think about the track listing when I'm playing a live show because it's an experience for my crowd and I want to take them through a musical journey that goes down and up and then, and then rises up towards the end and so on and so forth. That's when I kind of figure out my track listing. Okay. But for the album, I I let him do that because he is a, a huge music nerd and he's really into that kind of thing and he's better at it than me. So <laughs> I just, I go, you, you, you take the, you take the reins here, dude. And he does a fantastic job. And then when I listen back to the album in the order, I go, yeah, that's, that's a better order than I would have made up. Now, for for that in that sense does your does your mindset change based on the venue that you're playing like if you're playing like a small like if you're playing like a stadium show versus like a like a house of blues like does your mindset kind of change as far as like the journey you want to take people on or yeah depending on the audience you know if, if i'm playing like a metal festival in scandinavia then <laughs> i'll just fucking slam it all the way through if i'm playing a, a blues club in mississippi then I'll play more of the blues numbers, maybe with an acoustic moment, and maybe one kind of heavy rock song in there that's got a more of a blues vibe to it. But generally, when I'm doing tours, uh, I try to keep the set the same, okay. roughly all the way through, with with some changes here and there. Um, but that that's on a that, that's on a tour where I'm playing to my crowd, so it doesn't really matter so much. But when I'm playing a festival to a new crowd, then I'll try and adapt the set to fit them to what i think they would vibe with best and the order of the songs my aim is to put them in a trance you know okay. and, and to make them feel and experience something so i kind of start with that in mind and then figure out the set with that intention fair enough um tim i'm gonna throw it back to you sir so um you mentioned uh getting some of these conversations that were that you thought initially were adding conflict, but ended up ended up actually enhancing uh, the documentary. Um, the conversation that you that you filmed with uh, Jimmy Duck Holmes in particular, like, because I was sitting there the whole time, I was like, I wonder if they're going to talk about this. I wonder if they're going to kind of get into like the the history, of the blues, and all that. And so when you started touching on it, I went, Oh shit! All right, we're we're, we're going here. I will say as a as as a black guy, I it's it's one of those things that I I still have conversations with people about. But even I was sitting there going, "You're being a bit of a dick." Dude. <laughs> I was like, "You could there's there's a way to convey what you're feeling here in a less shitty way." And then you end up having this conversation with Bobby Rush, and in that conversation, I actually had to pause the movie after uh after you had that conversation because i was tearing up and it was just one of those like very raw very and i could feel like behind the camera and cam in real time kind of just going like wow like this is a lot to digest like can you talk to me about that conversation and like how did you know where to cut it because i felt like i could have watched that conversation for you know 20 minutes but um i thought you did a great job with it but yeah can you kind of talk to me about that so Bobby and I kind of go back a little bit. I, I've met Bobby a few years before we we shot um, with Cam, and I read his book, so I, I knew um, that he had a lot of of good stories uh, from his past that dealt with civil rights, and uh, all of them were really raw. 
and some of the stuff that um that I read he didn't even talk about I mean go check out his book um it's it's amazing but um with with Bobby you just kind of I, I told him that we uh, I, we needed to touch on it I felt like we're going to do something about the blues you, you kind of would be remiss to not talk about how that music came from real life struggles you know yeah. and um and and how you know it, it's still I don't want to say it's taboo, but it's it's still some people still look at white people performing blues, blues music as, as blasphemy. Um, I don't think as much people today do, um, just simply because the the genre isn't as relative as it once was. But um, there there's still a big contingency of people who if they see a white guy playing blues, like ah, you know, um, and that's yeah. just the way it is, man. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. It's just the way people think. Um, I can see both sides of that coin. I think music is music, and if uh, if, if you're feeling it, you, you got to play it. And I think that's what Cam does. I don't think he's looking to exploit a genre or, or steal anybody's music, as he said. But yeah. anyway, back to Bobby. Um, Bobby, I kind of said, you know, this is what we want to touch on based on the things I read in your book. And basically, Cam, correct me if I'm wrong, we, we just sat down with him, and he kind of took off. It, we didn't really need to to tee it up or anything he he kind of knew exactly where he wanted to go and drove the point home and um he was just the most gracious guy i mean the guy is um goodness is he 90 now he, he's he's pushing 90 and, and just as vital as ever and sharp as attack and a hell of a musician and um he told us that, that was the first time he's ever invited anybody into his home. So I, wow. I, uh, I, I take that as a testament to, to Cam and, and, um, and just, you know, I can't say enough good things about Bobby, man. He's, he's, um, I'm privileged that he wanted to be a part of it. Yeah. Cam, if you want to touch on that. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a really incredible experience to jam with Bobby. Um, Hearing his stories was one thing, but playing music with him was another. And we really hit it off, I felt, musically. Um, he just kind of got a groove going and then I, I followed up on it and um, just created a little song there and then, you know, and that's what I love to do, man. Um, and for me, that's where we did the real talking. And uh, I really, really enjoyed the conversation we had musically, you know. It felt very I, I will say natural. That Cam, yeah, it, it, well, it, it was funny because we were taking Cam to these places and, and um, R.L. Boyce, the late R.L. Boyce, I think he and Cam got along great, but R.L. was just such a, a quirky personality. <laughs> and then there were some conflicts with Jimmy and, and, and Cam sitting there. I, I remember you telling me, it's like, are you just going to take me to these places where these guys just like shut all over me? <laughs> so, yeah. I, think, I think Bobby was like the first one who actually <laughs> got you and vibe with you. And it kind of like, I, I hope it, I, I think it did. It, it kind of changed your um, vibe about the whole project because there for a while, I, I was kind of feeling the same way. I'm like, man, I hope everywhere we go, he doesn't just kind of like get ragged on by these guys that I'm <laughs> introducing him to. <laughs> um i did want to ask you uh cam you you mentioned um kind of offhand but you said that you found uh hotel rooms to be soulless uh what wh <laughs> like i i love the term soulless not like terrible or annoying but soulless i was like damn that's that's cutting like what wh wh why soulless i'm just i'm curious i i've just never really enjoyed hotels man like i i, I live in my truck and that's how I've traveled. And that's how I do a lot of my tours, living in my vans and my trucks. And it's, I, I like to come home after a gig, after working and be in my own space. You know, going into a hotel is, it's not your space. Do you know what I mean? It's it's multiple people's spaces and we all share it. So how can it have a soul if that's what it is? You know, whereas my my home, everyone's home, it's almost like a bit of their soul. You know, they they put themselves into it. So I like to um, submerge into that after a day of working. So, and that's, you know, doing the documentary and, and being in that old Ford camper van, I, I kind of made it my own for, a, you know, a month or two, however long it was. So that, that was the vibe for me. 
Um, so I will say, and I've, I've talked about freely on the podcast. I, I, I smoke weed quite a bit. I feel like I have like 80 things I always want to say, and it just helps kind of center me, calm me down and kind of get me in, into my zone for when I do a review. What is your, uh, what is your song, uh, songwriting process like? Like, does it change like based on album? Do you have a set routine? Like, how do you, how do you kind of approach writing something? Well, funny enough, you mentioned weed. Like, drugs are definitely a part of it. If you ask me, um, it's uh, or sometimes not drugs. It, it depends. You know, you just kind of follow a vibe. But for some reason, when you're stoned or tripping on whatever you're tripping on it definitely helps to encourage a vibe in the first place. Yeah. And um, it also helps to encourage you following that vibe right to the core of what it is and then expressing that emotion or whatever it is that you're feeling. Um, and I'm not talking necessarily in a, a, a lyrical way, but more of a melodic way. For me anyways, that's just how it is. Uh, a lot of writers, they focus more on the lyrics and sometimes I, I do focus on lyrics, but I'm much more of a melody man. Okay. Um, and I feel that that's the language that I connect with a lot more than my own language, if you know what I mean. Now, are there certain, are there certain, so like I only, like I've only smoked weed. I haven't done like shrooms or anything like that. Um, I'm looking to do that because I'm unemployed right now. So fuck it, I have to talk. <laughs> but uh... that's not a good enough reason, man. <laughs> not when you're unemployed. <laughs> Crack, definitely not. Definitely. Oh not no, no, no. Unemployed. I. <laughs> oh no, no, no. Like, like that. Like shrooms would probably be my threshold. Like I, you know. Yeah. Well, because I mean, I grew up in church, so I heard the whole like gateway drug, and so like when I, you know, actually tried weed, I was like, oh wow, weed's great. Why the fuck was I not, you know, doing this forever ago? But, um. But I remember you saying like you tried every drug. Uh, I think you said except for crystal meth. I think that was the yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. I still haven't done that one. Okay, I'm still gonna... for the situation to arise. Come on, you gotta. You, that's been two years ago almost. You, yeah, I thought you would have tried it by now. <laughs> I know, I know. So I thought I would have as well, man. Out. But no, it hasn't happened yet. I'll let you know. And I've been most... crystal meth since then. Come on, dude. <laughs> 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 so i'm gonna ask a question that you guys are probably both gonna hate but fuck it i'm gonna ask it anyway um if uh five artists if someone were to tell you like give me five artists that encompass you as a person musically what five artists are you going with uh tim i'll start with you uh okay um well i'll tell you one of them's right here prince nice um, hell yeah. yeah let's go <laughs> i love uh everything prince does um i just i think he's the consummate creative he's an incredible guitar player he's an incredible um vocalist dancer i mean the guy's total package um so he would be like one of those faces on mount Everest. second is um i don't know if you can tell what that is but that's a little subtle van halen tribute thing oh, that okay that right here yeah uh, yeah it was on the back of the 84 tour shirts so um Eddie Van Halen is the reason I play guitar. Um, he's just, he was the coolest in my book. And I love David Lee Roth. I could tell you a lot of stories about my encounters with Dave, but I don't want to bore you guys. Uh, so those are the main two. After that, um, I love Led Zeppelin. Nice. I love Pink Floyd. I'm a big classic rock guy and I love okay. Stones. But there's five. Okay. Yeah, the still so I got I, I got more into the stones over the last like decade or so. Like I, I, I discovered I really got into the stones and uh um oh my god, why the fuck am I blank on his name? I should be um Springsteen. Jesus, I should have had that quicker. Yeah. Uh, but I, I got into them a lot more in the last decade. So I that that's fair. Uh Cam, what about you, sir? Um it, the question was was what arts would you encompass? Did you say? I, yeah, yeah, five artists that encompass you as a person. If someone's like, give oh, me five, right. okay, yeah. okay, yeah, um, yeah, well, that'd be Kurt Cobain, nice. Uh, that would be Max Cavalera from Soulfly for his riff writing, okay. Uh, that would be John Lennon, definitely. Nice. Um, who else? So that's three. Who else would there be? Do you know what? Let's throw Liam Gallagher in there just because I think he's got one of the greatest rock and roll voices of all time, okay. Um, who else would there be? On the who's going to take the last slot? Um, 
I'm going to say Jimi Hendrix, I'd say. Oh, see, Hendrix would be on mine. So that's a, that's a, that's a great yeah. choice. Yeah. Lo love Hendrix. Yeah. Yeah. Um, really random just cause like people don't expect me to listen to him, but, um, I'd probably go shit. I'd probably go Kendrick, um, Hendrix, um, James Taylor. I fucking love James Taylor. Like James Taylor is someone that I, if anyone talks to me about music, I'm, I, I throw out three James Taylor songs, uh, right out the, uh, right out the box. Um, shoot um probably go lyle love it too because i just love his music like he has a very like like a very niche sound but i just i love his sound and then um man five that's four i'd probably go sting honestly because i think soul i think 10 summer's tales and soul cages is, are two of my favorite albums and no one ever expects me to pull those. So when I so when I say them, people are like, "Really?" It's like, "Yeah, listen to these." Um, so <laughs> I I love both your I, I love both your uh, your uh, answers there. Um, we are sad to come up to time, so I'm going to ask you guys. I got one more question for both y'all. Um, Tim, doing this documentary. Um, what what is the is there a message? Is there is there anything? like you want the audience to take away from this outside of just getting to know cam a little better. You know, I, I think, um, at the end of the film, cam kind of wraps it up, um, really nicely. And he touched on it a little bit where he, he says, you know, if you look on social media, you think everybody hates each other. And, um, you know, it's just not the case. Uh, I, I think whenever you dig down and, and go beyond the surface of anything or anybody and get to know them on a deeper level, um, you, you'll you find some common ground and i i think i tried to show a little bit of that with the film i mean i know we had some conflicts there and it wasn't as rosy as i at first envisioned it to be but um <laughs> you know i i think that would probably be something i hope people would pick up on is that we're not as divided as we think we are and i think cam um did a good job of just kind of rolling with the punches and, and letting that story tell itself you know Love that. Uh, Cam, what about you, sir? Um, so it was, uh, it, yeah, I mean, it, it was a, it was a, quite an experience. It was a bit of an adventure, uh, doing the Americana Blues Triangle and playing those shows and, and rolling with that crew and, uh, having a documentary filmed about yourself as, as bizarre as it is. <laughs> it, um, it's funny I, I want to touch on that first question you asked me because I like I, I, I'm not great with cameras and phones and social media that kind of thing so I don't think I really answered it to my best ability I said it was we had a bonding session and it was pleasurable that sounds not quite exactly what I was going for to be honest <laughs> <laughs> <Fair> <laughs> so let me just go over that with it's um, I, I, I don't I genuinely don't like being on camera you know I, I i want to play music and i have i feel i have a lot to express on a musical level and that's kind of brought me on to being on camera uh but that being said like being on the road and filming this documentary at first was very daunting and made me feel very nervous yeah but as time went on and telling this story i i did really find my 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 feet um and i was really happy to tell the story and be a part of it it was really really cool uh, and let it tell itself just as as tim just said you know yeah it was um it was it was it was really something i'm very very happy with it i love that answer and i will simply say i don't watch things twice very often especially in a very short amount of time so i i i watched this documentary twice within uh within uh like three days and I, like I said, I enjoyed it more the the, the second time. So, um, Tim, Cam, I cannot express enough how much of a joy this was, and I really appreciate uh, both of you for taking the time uh, to speak with me today. This was just uh, this was very pleasant. Uh, so, thank you for that. It was a really nice start to my day. Um, uh, Tim, if you could kind of tell us, uh, I know this is out next week on the 28th it's going to be like everywhere right like prime video all that yeah all that anywhere you, exactly anywhere you can uh buy or rent uh video i know that's uh includes 
Apple TV, uh, Amazon Prime, YouTube, a host of other cable um, outlets. Pretty much whenever wherever you can find it, it'll be there, man. Um, yeah, it'll be global, or at least in places where they speak English. <laughs> no. <laughs> And then, and then I did want to shout out as well um, the 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 score the, or the album for uh, uh, for American Mileage. It is on uh, it is on streaming. I was actually listening to that this morning, uh, so please check that as as uh, as well. But uh, I'm glad you uh, brought that up, man. If I could just say real quick, because yeah, I threw please. that at Cam and his manager Marcus, just like you know, it'd be good, guys. You know, it'd be great is if you guys could come up with. I mean, I kind of like just like threw that out there, and I'll be damned, man, if they didn't just crush it, dude. So. Um, I was just so happy with the way Cam kind of remembered those things and, and transformed them into compositions, man. It was just really cool. Uh, I will say that the the track throwback is my is my personal favorite. So so when people do listen to that, uh definitely check out that track. Uh but uh but Cam Cole, Tim Hardiman, thank you so much, gentlemen, for the time. I hope this uh I hope this does well and have a great rest of your day, guys. Thank you so much again for making the time. Thank, thank you, Hunter. Appreciate it's it, man. Bye, guys. Take care. Uh, hell yeah. Um, absolutely love that interview. Um, again, uh, Tim uh, Tim Hardiman and uh, Cam Cole, thank you so much for stopping by the show and talking about American knowledge with me. Um, it was an absolute joy. Truly was a pleasure to have them have them on. And uh, I'm so excited for you all to see this. Uh, this will be coming out on uh, May 28th. Uh, wherever you're uh, on VOD, wherever you get your movies from, so uh, Apple TV, uh, Apple TV Prime Video, uh, Google Play, all the places you can go ahead and watch this, and it is well worth your time. I had an absolute joy watching it, and uh, not gonna lie, I I've been listening to Cam uh, Cole since uh, I saw him on Ted Lasso, but just even more reason uh, for me to get back into his stuff, but. Uh, again, gentlemen, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, as far as what's coming up on the podcast, um, we're heading to my birthday month. Uh, June 1st is officially my birthday. So I will have, uh, I'm going to have some stuff for Pride Month. Um, the list as I currently have it, um, I am going to, I might end up tweaking some stuff, but uh uh, the list as I currently have it, at least. So I've got quite a few uh, films for Pride Month. So what I'm looking at currently is uh, But I'm a Cheerleader, uh, uh, I Care A Lot, uh, Pray Away, uh, Baby Reindeer, The Death and uh, the death and Life of uh, Marsha P. Johnson, uh, Boy Erased, and Prom Dates, just to name a few. So I'm going to have reviews for all of those throughout the month of uh, June. As far as stuff I'm going to review for my birthday, I'm just going to review some stuff that maybe we haven't reviewed before. Might have some re-reviews, but just some stuff that uh, I really enjoy that I want to go ahead and review. So, uh, Hot Tub Time Machine is going to be a review. Hot Rod is going to be a review. Um, haven't really figured out what else I want to review. So, I'm going to be I'm going to be thinking on that over the next uh, couple days, and I'll probably end up posting a list uh, to my socials. But... Um, Speaking of my socials, go ahead and subscribe uh, to the show at uh, The Real Pineapple uh, on YouTube. That's uh, The R-E-E-L Pineapple. Uh, you can go ahead and subscribe to the show on Twitch because I do stream on there at twitch.tv slash The Real Pineapple. Uh, you can pretty much uh, like, uh, like and uh, subscribe and rate the show. It definitely helps me out. Uh, you can pretty much listen to the podcast wherever you check out podcasts, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts. Podbean, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Amazon Music, TuneUp, and Samsung Podcast, to name a few. You can follow me on the Twitter at jhunterrealpineapple. Um, that's jhunter, and then R-E-E-L, and then pineapple. You can follow me on Instagram and a TikTok at the same spots, at jhunterrealpineapple. You can follow me on Letterboxd at Black Shazam, and you can follow me on Blue Sky at realpineapple.bsky.social. By the time you listen to this, my review uh, for the documentary American Fiction, as as well as this interview, will be live. So go ahead and check those out. I already mentioned the Pride uh, Month stuff I'm going to have uh, coming up. And then, uh, yeah, stuff for my birthday as well. Uh, gosh, what else is coming up? Uh, going to have a review for all the Bad Boys films. Uh, my review for Bad Boys for Life is already up on the channel. But I'll have a review for Bad Boys and Bad Boys 2 as well. 
And then I'll have reviews coming up here for uh, Beverly Hills Cop Axel F, along with the original trilogy of Beverly Hills Cop film, I already, uh, films. I already have those reviewed. And uh, I'm going to have a review for X-Men Origins Wolverine, uh, leading up into Deadpool and Wolverine. And, oh my gosh, I know there's other stuff, but that's all I can think of off the top of my head right now. Oh yeah, and I'll have a review for at least the first three Despicable Me films leading up to Despicable Me 4. So, yeah, lots of reviews coming out of the pipeline for y'all. But everyone, thank you so much for listening. Stay safe, take care of each other. Tell someone tell someone something nice about themselves today. Give someone a compliment. We could all use some more some more positivity. Uh, and never forget, as always, to keep it real. Yeah.